everything on earth will be valued against Bitcoin. People saying, oh, this isn't going to happen for another hundred years, I think is absolutely crazy because Bitcoin doesn't grow linearly. Fiat doesn't die linearly. It happens very suddenly. The ability to use it as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system is the crux of, of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin. The most powerful people in my future are going to be Bitcoiners. Fiat currencies have a limited shelf life and most of the world is on a fiat standard. And because of that, the Bitcoiners uh, are going to be the, the best off and going to have the biggest head start. Spending Bitcoin isn't only not bad, but it, but that it's also good and it can be beneficial to you and to your Bitcoin economy, to the Bitcoin network. You are choosing to be more poor than you need to be because the person that is converting their checking account, their spending account and moving everything on that side over to a Bitcoin standard as well is actually going to end up richer than you because they're staying in Bitcoin longer and they have more exposure to Bitcoin. You could easily sell over six figures of Bitcoin every year, live on that and pay zero dollars in tax to the IRS. You said one interesting sentence where before we started, um, without the medium exchange sides, like we, we, we probably will not have the store of value side, uh, which is, um, I think against that, what, uh, Saifedean, I think Saifedean probably was one of the first that, that said it, maybe people before had said it also like store of value and then the medium of exchange comes. Um, why is medium of exchange in, in your eyes so, so important for, for Bitcoin and the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh. At the core. Well, there are a lot of small reasons, but at the core, the main reason is because uh, Bitcoin without the, um, the value of being able to use it as a medium exchange and by that defining, you can send it to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Um, without that function of Bitcoin, you don't have Bitcoin. Um, and therefore, in my eyes, uh, you know, Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have any value um, because it's just another financial instrument that gets buried in with the rest. So um, the ability to use it as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system is the crux of, of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin. And again, that really comes down to being able to use it as a medium of exchange. Now, I will say that there is some nuance there, you know, being able to use it as a medium of exchange on different scales. You know, there is a conversation to be had there where, you know, whether it's a large entity like a business to business type transaction or even nation state to nation state, like that would be a huge scale. I'm not necessarily saying that it's a prerequisite or a requirement for, you know, being able to buy your coffee on layer one. Um, but you have to have some degree of the ability uh, to transact in a peer to peer way without any third parties for Bitcoin to have any value at all. And there are a lot of layers to it because like there's first like the technical layers that uh, Bitcoin is just technically so advanced that we can buy a coffee with it, maybe with layer two or layer three technology. Uh, and then there's also the legal side to it, because in Austria, if I buy coffee with Bitcoin, I have to pay capital gains tax if the Bitcoin in, in the meantime uh, went up, uh, which it, it usually does. Um, is, is it like, I think the technical side is, is definitely required and it, it will be developed. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of time till the uh, tech is advanced enough. But do we also need long term to, for, in order Bitcoin to be successful, uh, also the legal tender status, no capital gains tax, a free, free transaction of Bitcoin? No, I don't, I don't think that it's required at all. Um, I think that given, you know, the current nature of, of how the regulatory bodies view Bitcoin, we have everything we need for Bitcoin to keep scaling. Now, eventually, I think that it will flip, right? Because um, Bitcoin is just this uh, amazing technology for aligning incentives. And you'll see, you know, the game theory play out uh, across the world where countries, nation states will do everything they can to attract people to come to their country, to develop in their country. And the most powerful people in my future are going to be Bitcoiners because the, you know, the, the purchasing power and the, the value itself of the, the Bitcoin is only going to appreciate against all of the fiat that's, you know, going down. Um, you know, these fiat currencies have a limited shelf life and most of the world is on a fiat standard. And because of that, the Bitcoiners, um, the people that have that live on a Bitcoin standard are going to be, you know, essentially the, the best off and going to have the biggest head start. And these countries are going to be fighting over that. So I don't think it's required again, but I do think it is an inevitable outcome.
So, mm. you know, we're going to have countries that really priority, really prioritize, you know, maybe things like illegal tender. I'm personally not for legal tender laws as a whole, just because it is, um, you know, uh, an imposition of the government basically forcing people to do something. Um, I don't think that that's required with Bitcoin. So you take the example of El Salvador. Um, I think El Salvador is a good example because that's maybe an exception because it was the first. Um, I think it's, you know, still probably too early at this phase, uh, this this uh, point in time in order to, you know, if you're really wanting to make some radical changes like Nea Bukele has done, the president of El Salvador, um, legal tender was the fastest way to make that happen. So, you know, if he would have done something like um, uh, like a free currency, like what you're seeing in, I think Argentina is, is talking about doing something like this, where they're just allowing currencies to compete with each other um, and different forms of money. But when you do something like that, it's, it's a lot slower of a process to roll out. Now, again, I think it's inevitable with Bitcoin, but I can see both sides um, where you have legal tender laws and, you know, maybe just some uh, less regulation or you could say deregulation of the currency. And I think it's important to, to have a, a Bitcoin economy. Uh, I mean, uh, I, for example, uh, have um, one of my sponsors pays me in Bitcoin uh, only. Uh, the other ones pay me in fiat uh, so I can have like, <laughs> I can pay my fiat bills without selling Bitcoin, which it would be a lot of... Uh, paperwork <laughs> for me to do so i like to do it in that way um which is a cool thing where when you can split your like payments in fiat and bitcoin um but then also like sometimes i spend bitcoin like i spend bitcoin on a bitcoin meetup or bitcoin conferences so like that's like the the start of this circular economy uh where i didn't get the permission of the austrian national state that like oh yeah you should use bitcoin as legal tender but I still use it. I pay other people with it. And it's a, it's a very satisfying feeling that there's like a private money uh, that is open, permissionless, transparent, uh, and every, all that things. Uh, and we can just use it. And it's, it's, it's uh, firing up that circular economy. I think there's two sides to that. And you just mentioned a lot of great reasons why using Bitcoin in a circular, circular economy is beneficial. Um, I think using Bitcoin, like the Bitcoin economy, meaning, you know, you've got people that are living on a Bitcoin standard. Maybe you've got people that are somewhere in between a fiat standard and a Bitcoin standard, which is a lot of, you know, us Bitcoiners right now. Um, and then on top of that, you've got all this infrastructure, you've got people accepting Bitcoin for payment or doing currency conversions. Um, things like that are beneficial for Bitcoin because, uh, like you said, it's, you know, it, it's got all these, all these benefits. It's, it's private. Uh, it's uncensorable to uh, you know to a degree, depending on how you're using it. If you're using it in in the way uh, the white paper intends it to be, you know there's nobody that can stop that. You got to hold your own keys in order for that to happen. Um, but there are seriously some some major so sovereignty benefits to using Bitcoin as your money and as your spending currency. And I think that's really where um, I'd like to focus a, a lot of this conversation is because. A lot of people are, for some weird reason, against spending Bitcoin. There are a lot of reasons, you know, that I found. Um, I focused on this for a while. Um, but a lot of people have this idea that spending Bitcoin is bad. And my goal is to hopefully try to help convince people that spending Bitcoin isn't only not bad, but, it, but that it's also good. And it can be beneficial to you and to your Bitcoin economy, to the Bitcoin network, uh, and, you know, uh, everybody as a whole. So my point there is spending Bitcoin is actually a lot easier and more beneficial than a lot of people realize. Now, I will say there are some hurdles. You mentioned one. So paying capital gains taxes. A lot of people have this idea that, hey, I don't want to spend my Bitcoin because that means, one, I'm going to have to track the taxes, and two, I'm going to have to pay them. These are problems that are very trivial to solve. I mean, you can run some software pretty easily that can track your cost basis. And at the end of the year, when it comes time to pay your taxes, you know, you press one button, you get a report, you send that to your tax guy and you pay the taxes. Now that's the other part, right? Some people are just adamantly opposed to uh, paying taxes. 
uh, or even may, maybe more specifically capital gains taxes. But I want to kind of get into the breakdown there because I think there is um, some, uh, I don't know, cognitive dissonance perhaps in that mindset. Let me explain why. In order to avoid paying capital gains taxes on Bitcoin, you have to spend fiat, which means you've got to hold fiat. And so I'm not personally against holding any fiat. I hold fiat, you know, to some degree. But the argument that I want to try to make is that moving the majority or at least the more the more fiat you can move into Bitcoin, the more beneficial you will be. So my point is, it's OK to spend Bitcoin and have these capital gains taxes as long as it's beneficial to you in the long run in every way imaginable. So. You know, one of the reasons that people have this is the the idealistic component of spending uh, or paying the IRS for capital gains taxes. They're like, I just don't want to pay that. Well, that's like a that's a you know a, a financial perspective. You know, thinking like I'm going to be worse off financially because I'm going to do that. Well, I can give you you know some pretty clear examples that would explain why that's not the case. There's also the ideal component, the idealistic component. Again, like I mentioned, they just don't want to pay the IRS at all. Um, but again, the solution, their solution to that is by using fiat. I don't think that's a solution. That's just using central bank currencies, um, which you know is, is arguably no better than funding the IRS. So here's my example: if you've got you know two different people, um, one person is you know using uh, fiat for their, let's just say like their checking or their spending account. And another person is using Bitcoin. Now, I probably don't have to convince a whole lot of people that having Bitcoin and savings is a good idea. Using Bitcoin as a store of value, as we discussed, that's a very easy topic to get across to a lot of people. Now, there's obviously some people in the world that are still not of the mindset that Bitcoin is a great store of value, but that's a, that's a separate subject. I'm, I'm specifically talking about you know, Bitcoiners, people that hold Bitcoin. And when I go through this, let me just say what I'm about to outline and explain really doesn't pertain to anybody or it doesn't pertain to everybody. So if you are somebody who does not believe that Bitcoin is going to appreciate in value against the US dollar or fiat currencies in general, then this probably isn't for you. But I think the vast majority of people watching and listening to this are of the mindset that you know, the fiat value of, of the currency that they're holding in fiat is going to go down and Bitcoin is going to appreciate against that fiat. So that that's kind of who I'm talking to. Um, the other way, the only the other category of people that this wouldn't apply to is people that um, believe they can time markets. So if you think that you are smarter than the market and you can get in and out at exactly the right time, um, then this advice probably isn't for you. Um, I have found out the hard way that I am not smarter than the market. <laughs> um, I used to trade plenty and, uh, yeah, that was a, a humbling experience that turned me into, uh, you know, a hardcore Bitcoin maxi. So here I am today. Um, but let me give you this example. So you got, again, these two people, one person, uh, gets paid a fiat paycheck. Let's just say both of these people get paid in fiat. It doesn't necessarily matter, but just for the sake of following uh, the example, let's say that, on day one, uh, the first day of the month, you get a paycheck and it's $100. Let's say, just keep math simple. The first person keeps that $100 because they know they've got $100 worth of bills or things that they need to buy that month. So they keep it in fiat because they're like, oh, I don't want to convert it to Bitcoin and then worry about the capital gains and tracking taxes and, and all that. And I don't want to lose money. So they keep it in fiat. At the end of the month, um, you know, they've, they've spent $100 and they have $0 left. So they've, they've gotten $100 worth of goods and services, and they've got nothing left over. The other person, on the other hand, on day one, they get their $100 paycheck. They put it into Bitcoin, right? They buy Bitcoin. They buy SATs with it. At the current value of Bitcoin compared to dollars, that's about 170,000 SATs. So again, let's go back to day one. So starting on day one, person A has $100 in fiat. Person B has 170,000 sats, which is equivalent to about $100. Let's say over the course of the month, Bitcoin appreciates against the dollar to the tune of 10%. So it goes from $59,000, which is kind of where we are today, 
to $65,000. Okay. This is over the course of a month. Let's just assume that that is the effective uh, increase for person B. Let's just say that they spent all their money at the very last day of the month and they got, you know, that whole 10% of capital gain. So both people started with $100. Person A at the end of the month has $100 worth of goods and services that they paid for. Person B has $100 worth of goods and services that they paid for, but they paid for it while, or I guess I should say after they had converted their fiat to Bitcoin. So at the end of the month, person A has $0, zero sats, and zero capital gains tax liability. Person B has zero dollars, but now they have 15,000 sats left over, which is about $10, right? So you've got a, a 10% increase, which is a 10% capital gain, right? So $10, $10 worth of uh, Bitcoin at $65,000 is about 15,000 sats. So again, just so I don't lose anybody, right now, person A has nothing and no capital gains tax liability, but they did get $100 worth of goods and services. So did person B. They got the $100 worth of goods and services. They have $0 in fiat, but they have 15,000 sats. Okay. So now you're like, you have to track all that, of course. So the, the hard part is is doing that. But again, that's that's just a software thing. You can There's plenty of software out there that will already do this for you. Um I'm building a, a, a Bitcoin wallet that will have, you know, this software built into it to make things easy. Um, but there's there's a lot of options out there. You can do this manually if you want. Obviously, I don't really recommend that. But the IRS is obviously going to come, you know, looking for their check too. Now, what does that, you know, what does that look like? Well, the average person's probably going to pay somewhere around 20% in capital gains uh, for long-term holdings. And then somewhere around, you know, probably 15 to 25 percent, let's just call it 20 percent for short term uh, capital gains. So depending on how you're spending your Bitcoin does change and affect this. Um, again, that's that's kind of probably something you would want to rely on software to track for you just because keeping track of, you know, which coins you're spending, um, you know, maybe a little bit difficult if you're doing it manually. But again, those are really the two scenarios. Either you're paying these capital gains from a long-term capital gain tax, meaning you're holding the coins for over 12 months um, or you're paying uh, with short-term, which means you're just paying capital gains at the rate of your income tax, okay? And this applies to the United States, okay? If you're outside of the U.S., I, I don't know, you know, which laws do and don't apply. This is specific to the U.S. I'm not a tax professional. Uh, this is just my interpretation of the tax law. So make sure you uh, consult your tax professional. Um, but the IRS is going to look for, you know, let's just say 20%. That is uh, 30 sats in this example. So person B, they remember, they ended up with 15,000 sats. Now they have to pay the IRS 30 sats. That's 20 cents, right? So person A has nothing except for the, you know, the stuff they bought the stuff they needed, you know, food, shelter, their bills, whatever. Person B paid for the same things, but person B has Bitcoin left over. Yeah, sure. They've got to give, you know, they got to give that extortion cut to the IRS, but that was 30 sats out of 15,000 sats. That's, that's 20%. So uh, person B ends up with 14,970 sats at the end of it. Now, you might have, you know, the, 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 the big argument here is, wait a second, you know, this is if Bitcoin appreciates by 10% over that month, like it's a very, you know, cherry picked uh, example. Fair enough. But let's let's look at this. If again, this goes back to what I said earlier before I begin, if you if you believe the Bitcoin price in, in terms of its its uh, conversion rate to the dollar is going to appreciate against the dollar, then over time, this scenario actually happens more often than the opposite. So yes, you could have a month where you lose some money. But over time, and again, let's just look back historically speaking. Over a four-year period, Bitcoin has only ever gone up in fiat terms compared to where it was, you know, at any point four years prior. 
So if you if you just live on this strategy for four years, as long as you're using the historical data to make your model, then this is guaranteed to have you end up in a better position, statistically speaking. So that's my argument against people that don't want to spend Bitcoin because they don't want to pay capital gains taxes. And here's here's what I have to say about that. You are choosing to be more poor than you need to be. Because the person that is converting their checking account, their spending account, and moving everything on that side over to a Bitcoin standard as well, is actually going to end up richer than you because they're staying in Bitcoin longer and they have more exposure to Bitcoin. That's a really interesting uh, way to think about it. Um, especially also like one, I think, I don't know how it's in America and 50% of my audience is in America, so it's, it's highly relevant. Uh, I know in Austria, it's like if you make capital gains, like if you make profits in one month and in the other month you make losses, you can differentiate them and like only pay for actually what you made uh, in, in the end of the year and not like <laughs> only only the profits are, are taxed and the losses are uh, negated. Uh, mm -hmm. So even if, it, this, if there's like a down month and you lose money, then you can write that off of the profits that you paid the other month, uh, which which makes that model even better. How I do it, uh, I, I kind of use that um, flexible credit system of banks where they are like, hey, you have a checking account. I saw like since five years, they are, co they are consistently is coming mo money in. Uh, and uh, I just use that uh, where I have like an, um, how is it called in English? I have no clue. But it's it's just like um, credit on the go. Like you can just like take it uh, when you need it. Uh, if, even if you go to the minus, it's it's not like um, you have to make a contract for that and stuff like that. So I can go, I think, up to ten or twenty thousand euros in, in into loss, uh, and it's really cool because I can spend my Bitcoin. I can spend uh, with my fiat everything, and I'm trying always to hit the zero. So if I'm like just like a few. 50 euros or like 100 euros in the plus in my bank account, I'm uh, going, uh, I'm taking them and throwing them in my Bitcoin wallet directly. If I'm under, under the zero, I'm just like, don't invest in Bitcoin as long as I'm back at the zero. So I'm kind of using um, the, the credit system of the fiat system. Uh, there's also another group of people that might uh, look into borrowing completely against the Bitcoin. So like they're taking the Bitcoin and, and wanting uh, to borrow against it because my variance, I have to pay interest rates. Like that's the argument against my thing because the interest rates on that are obviously higher uh, because you don't have to uh, post any collateral. Uh, you can use it for consumer. There's like no purpose behind that. There's no negotiation. That's just like the bank giving it to every customer uh, with a different frame, but uh, basically everyone gets the same one. But it's not a lot of money because I usually pay it off really quickly. So it's like, uh, uh, bro probably ends up being the same as the capital gains tax. Uh, I don't know uh, if it compares like that. But what do you think of using the credit system in the way that I use it or the credit system uh, in the way other people might use it with borrowing against uh, the Bitcoin? Great questions. Um, let me make sure I understand your strategy. So you are essentially taking all of your money your value that you're receiving you're putting it all into bitcoin and then you're spending on credit and paying that off with bitcoin as needed yeah basically like uh, i always keep it around zero so sometimes i'm like minus 500 sometimes like plus 500 but i'm always trying to hit my bank account with around zero uh, and if there's like a big check from a sponsor coming in I'm giving it to uh, in the Bitcoin. Then mm -hmm. it might be uh, again like it was maybe a thousand euros in the plus. I'm giving that into Bitcoin. Uh, then there's maybe next week I have to pay rent. Then I'm a thousand euros in the minus. I'm waiting till the next check that I'm back at zero again. So I just use that flexible system. So I'm always kind of hundred percent in Bitcoin. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. ninety nine point five percent. Sometimes yeah. hundred and 0.5%. So th that's that's what I use. Uh, and yeah, the, the next thing is what I hear a lot of people talking like, oh yeah, like just went to my bank and gave them my proof that I have like uh, one Bitcoin and I got like a few thousand euros for that to, to pay some bills. So using the credit strategy is 
getting all of the benefits of what I just described. Um, so you're, you're still, you still have all the maximum Bitcoin exposure, um, which is where the benefits of what I outlined come from. The only uh, difference is that you're exposing yourself to credit, which can be a, a good or a bad thing or neutral, depending on how you want to look at it, but it's just another layer. So, you know, there is some degree of, uh, I guess, maybe leverage or risk because you're spending uh, on credit. So you're essentially, you're essentially entering into a financial contract alone with somebody that you have to pay back at a later date. Um, that is fine. That's kind of a separate subject, but I think what you're asking is, you know, is that a good strategy to maximize your financial position? I would say certainly, absolutely. So again, what you're saying with the, with the credit, uh, strategy where you put all of your, uh, spending on, on like a credit card and then you pay off, you know, maybe the, the minimum payment or even the, you know, the full amount, if you paid off the full amount, it would essentially be exactly what I just described. Um, but you may have some additional fees from your credit card. So there may be a little bit of a fees in there as well. Um, and you're still going to have the capital gain if you're paying, paying that off with your Bitcoin. So whether you're buying goods or services or selling the Bitcoin for dollars to pay for the goods and services in the United States, in the eyes of the IRS, that is all selling Bitcoin. So you do have to account for that as a capital gain. Now, you brought something else up, and that was, you know, taking a loan against your Bitcoin as collateral. Um, this is a strategy that became popular um, a few years ago. I think Michael Saylor started talking about it a lot and, and using the analogy of taking collateral on other assets like real estate. I think his primary example is like Manhattan real estate. You know, you don't sell the real estate in Manhattan, you take a loan against it. And for a business and when you're, you know, at scale, uh, a very large scale, I think that makes sense. I think it does get a little bit problematic to get these Bitcoin loans um, at a smaller scale, an individual scale. And the reason is it's just, it's really risky. There's actually, there's a lot of risk. So you have the risk of liquidation. So if you don't capitalize your loan well enough or collateralize your loan well enough, your loan to value is not appropriately balanced. What can happen is in a huge drawdown, you could lose all of your Bitcoin, all of your collateral. Um, obviously, you can re, uh, re-collateralize your loans, but not everybody does or can. And so what, has, what you've seen happen um, and what uh, a, a popular uh, Bitcoin personality has talked about, uh, Mark Moss, he, he's brought this up. He got in that position where he was under-collateralized on one of his loans and he lost all the Bitcoin that he had in that loan. So it can definitely be dangerous from a um, from a collateral perspective and a liquidation perspective, but there's also a huge, huge, and let me reemphasize this, huge amount of counterparty risk. And I don't think this is something that a lot of people give enough credit to because you see all these businesses going out and offering these services and products for Bitcoin collateralized loans, um, but if they don't have all that properly on the backside, then what they have to do is they have to take risk on themselves. So let me give you a couple examples. You've got BlockFi. So they were a big one. Um, Celsius, right? These are two companies that went belly up. Why did they go belly up? Well, if you really break it down, they were offering Bitcoin collateralized loans at an APR that was too low. I mean, that's really what it all comes down to. So they were like, okay, you come do a, a Bitcoin collateralized loan with us and we're only going to charge you one and a half or 2% or 0% or whatever these companies were doing. It was super low. How were they affording to do that? Well, they have to go get that interest somewhere else. Um, and so they were, you know, using their money and they were financializing it and in investing it in companies like Three Arrows Capital, which ended up flopping. So they lost everything. What they do is they take your money, they rehypothecate it, um, you know, they go use it just like a just like a commercial bank would, um, but they don't have you know the Fed to back them up, and so when they fail, you know they fail. There's no one to bail them out, and that's what happened uh, a few years ago when all these companies went under. Um, there was just a, a lot of contagion in in the Bitcoin market because of all the leverage that was there. So my point is, Bitcoin collateralized loans can work if you know what you're doing and if you're working with a reputable company. And the easiest way to tell if 
your Bitcoin collateralized loan is a healthy loan or not, is you have to look at the interest rate. If your interest rate is lower than the rate of inflation, and let me define the rate of inflation. That rate of inflation is the cost of capital that your lender is having, that your lender has to pay. So if I go get a loan from company A, and company's A inflation rate is 15%, then the, the APR that I need to pay that company has to be over 15% or else they have to get that somewhere else. And that's just going to be added risk. So with that said, whatever the number is of inflation for you, whatever your, your number is, you know, whatever your estimate is, everybody's going to have a different number. But again, what is important is what is the interest rate or the inflation rate for the company that you're dealing with. If they're paying a certain amount of uh, a certain amount for for their inflation, so if their co operating costs are X, you have to be over that for your APR for your financial product to be protected. So that's a good way to know if you're getting scammed. If your interest rate is lower than the inflation rate, it's probably a scam. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. And I think it's always uh, important to note um, as, as, as soon as there's credit involved uh, you have to pay the credit somehow back uh, and obviously if you are a big company uh, as with Michael Saylor and, and he does those strategies on a really high level that I don't even understand what he's do, <laughs> doing on, on with those notes and stuff um, then you can easily do that because you have uh, predictable income coming in but life is not predictable and if you're just one person and you're like oh yeah i will have that uh, income over the next 10 years and i have this big loan and i can uh, uh, take advantage of bitcoin uh then you might be surprised if like i don't know in, in two years your income is not there anymore something happens in your life you need some somewhere else money so uh wherever there's credit involved and that's why i like your strategy a lot wherever there's credit involved uh you have to be careful uh, and 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 uh, really see if if like oh yeah is 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 that income really coming? Uh, can I actually loan against my Bitcoin? Because you don't want to have just because you wanna have the, the five percent more of of leverage in Bitcoin, uh, maybe lose all the Bitcoin. Like that's uh, introducing a, a risk that is not necessary as Bitcoin is already very uh, fast progressing and very um, uh, uh, extremely good performing uh, asset in in that sense. So. 
I think credit is, is um, sh should not be introduced if if not necessary. I choose to do it like that because it's such a small amount. Like I, it's literally uh, always less than one month of spending. Uh, I can really like I, I can compensate for that, and I'm very young, so I have a very high <laughs> risk tolerance. Uh, otherwise, I would not be 100% uh, in in Bitcoin. Um, and one conclusion of of, of yours uh, is that the price goes up. I 100% agree to that. Like I think Bitcoin price will go up <laughs> long term, uh, and I think probably like 99% of of people listening and watching um, will attest to that, and and will also say like, oh yeah, we think also that the Bitcoin price will go up long term, um, and most people will probably even say like why measure it in, in us dollars because us dollars like will, will go, go away to have a framework of of where we are at the adoption rate also maybe with with like um now we are coming into more more medium exchange usage uh and then also how do you think of like how valuable uh a bitcoin will be how valuable like 0 0.1 bitcoin will be uh in the future measured in maybe the us dollar measured in like how many houses i can buy uh because i think that's really interesting uh the, those pricing models yeah so there's a couple things there um firstly i think you will start to see um well not just start to see but you'll continue to see adoption of bitcoin as a medium of exchange um for a couple reasons. One, I believe it is a superior medium of exchange. Um, th the network itself is more robust than the fiat or central political currency payment systems. Um, but also, you have, you know, the the experience of, of, of people as they give it a try, as as they try it, they realize it works, they stick around. Why do you have all these people that have one foot in a Bitcoin standard and a fiat standard world, and they're able to see a lot of this um, in real time. Why are all of these people moving over to spending and prioritizing spending Bitcoin as a medium of exchange? You know, some examples are, you know, Jeff Booth, he's got um, a, a very strong opinion on it. Um, and he believes very strongly in using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Um, I just, recently shared a video of Nico from Simply Bitcoin explaining um, how he figured this out um, and how important it is to move over to a Bitcoin standard. Um, I recently shared a post from Corey Clipston, you know, um, and you've got uh, Francis Puglio with um, Bull Bitcoin. All of these people uh, see the importance of spending Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Why is that? These are people that have one thing in common. They have a lot of exposure of seeing both sides of this fence. They've spent time on both sides and they can see which side is better. So I think over time, more and more people will figure that out. And to the point of, that Nico made in the video that I shared um, recently, he says, you know, this is, this is a, kind of a cycle thing, right? It takes four years to really be able to comfortably put yourself into this position. But then it takes another four years to realize those benefits. Um, you gotta, you gotta kind of, it takes four years to step off into this, um, this category where you're, you're comfortable enough to actually give it a try. And then the next four years is you trying it out and realizing that it's actually working. And then you're actually better off because you did it. So it is, it is a, a very long process and it takes time. Everybody's going to need to take baby steps, but my recommendation is just go out there and try it. I'm not saying you have to convert all of your savings and all of your spending over to Bitcoin and be on a Bitcoin standard today. But do it a little bit of a at a time and give it a try. And then after a little bit of time, you're going to be like, oh, hey, I'm better off financially because I tried it. And then you're going to do it again and again and again and again. And then eight years later, you're going to realize, wow, I am a lot better off financially and I'm completely in a completely different financial position because of you know how much time I just spent in Bitcoin. It's just number go up technology. And to your question, you know, how do you value that? Do you value it in fiat? Do you value it in purchasing power and homes? Um, that's a really hard question to answer uh, because everybody's got, you know, a different perspective on how they want to look at it. Now, I recently have kind of come back to being okay with looking at it through lens of comparing it to the U.S. dollar or fiat in general. And the reason why is because it's really a gauge of how well Bitcoin is 
killing fiat, right? So fiat's got a lot of different roles, and I think Bitcoin is filling a lot of those roles. And I like to call it the Bitcoin scoreboard. That's just the price, like the, the fiat dollar price that the world sees, right? Every time the world, you know, the no coiners, everybody, every, anytime they hear or uh, hear about Bitcoin, they're always looking at the price of, you know, the dollar price of Bitcoin. That's just a scoreboard that shows how badly fiat is losing, right? And every time they look at the scoreboard, oh, there goes another, you know, X amount of points to Bitcoin. And that scoreboard just keeps going in one direction. And everybody's realizing that fiat is losing the game. So um, I'm okay with looking at it through that lens. I think that, there, you know, as you move over to a Bitcoin standard, there will be a time where you have more of a unit of account perspective of Bitcoin. I'm not, I'm really not there yet, admittedly. Like I can see both sides. Um, and in the past, it was really hard for me to see things through a unit of account perspective. Um, but we live in a world where, most of the people around us in the modern age interact with value in terms of dollars. And I think until hyperinflation hits in any country, I'm not saying it has to be in the U.S., but until hyperinflation hits, um, it's really hard for you to just switch over. Once you get to the hyperinflation stage of a fiat currency, you know, look at countries like Venezuela, Argentina, um, Turkey, all these countries, when they experience hyperinflation, they are forced to look at uh, their unit of account differently. And so it's really easy at that point to see Bitcoin from a unit of account perspective when you're comparing, you know, Bitcoin can buy this many houses. Um, so I think it's going to take some time to get to that point. But um, I've been looking at um, a couple different pricing models um, that are very popular lately. Stock to flow has been around for a little while, uh, as well as the power law. And it seems to be like there's, you know, kind of a, you know, a, a war online over the legitimacy of these models um, and which one's better. And it's, it's almost like, a, you know, this feud uh, between people and their, and their pricing models that they want to subscribe to. I, for a long time, was quite opposed to these pricing models because they're not real, right? They're just, it's just like an extrapolation of somebody's, you know, data on a chart that tries to predict the price. Over the last few days, I think I've actually changed my mind. And I messaged you about this and said, I think that I might want to talk about this just because it's kind of contentious, so to speak. You know, there's there's a lot of argument uh, on this. And I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of people that um, are a little bit taken back from from me saying that, that I'm uh, now starting to subscribe to some of these pricing models. Um, but let me let me do uh, let me give myself a shot to try to explain why you've got the stock to flow in the power law model. These are really like the two leading models that people like to use and reference when they're trying to project the future price of Bitcoin, which seems crazy on the surface. But I don't think it's actually as crazy now as I once did, because if you think about it, um, the, the price we'll just we'll, we'll call the price of Bitcoin being comparing Bitcoin to dollars. So the price of Bitcoin um, is essentially just dictated by two different ratios. It's a ratio of ratios. So you've got the ratio of supply and demand of Bitcoin, and you've got the ratio of supply and demand of fiat. Now, the ratio of those two ratios is essentially what you end up with with the price. Now, it looks like there's a bunch of variables there, right? So you've got the demand of Bitcoin, which seems to be a variable that is really hard to calculate. You've got the supply of fiat, where people make the argument that no one knows how many dollars are going to exist. You've got the demand of fiat, which seems to be fairly hard to calculate as well. But <laughs> I just recently came to, I had an epiphany. And that is that I, I don't, I no longer see this equation as a bunch of variables. When I look at this equation now, I see coefficients. Because when you look at, let's just start with the, the Bitcoin side. You've got the supply and demand of Bitcoin supply and demand. The supply is known. That's already a coefficient. We already know what the supply is going to be today, tomorrow, a hundred years from now. Now, obviously circulating supply is a different story, but let's just look at the, uh, or, uh, let's just look at the total outstanding supply. Um, and then look at the demand of Bitcoin. So let's, the, and this is what I think was so genius about Satoshi. I, I don't know if he, I don't know if he knew this when he created Bitcoin or discovered Bitcoin, however you want to look at it. Um, but it's playing out 
so perfectly. It makes me wonder if, if this had been something he thought about because nobody else really seems to be talking about this. And that is how much the, the having impacts the price. I think that uh, not enough people are, are, are really focused on the fact that the having is really driving the price. Um, and, and, and they're looking at it backwards where the, you know, the, the, the having is just simply taking supply out and then the market can, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, in a free markets. We got, we got a free efficient market. Um, you know, we price that model in. I don't think it's priced in. I really don't. And, and, and I'll explain why. So, um, we're again, we're just, this is going to be kind of a long con- or a long explanation, but we're looking at the Bitcoin side right now, supply and demand supply is known demand. Now, we can kind of chart the demand of Bitcoin over time. Okay. So uh, demand may increase. Let's just look at a four-year period. So demand may increase, you know, maybe 25 basis points, somewhere in that ballpark, right? Which is kind of, I think, pretty uh, historically uh, applicable, right? So we probably maybe 25 basis points every four years. I'm just kind of throwing out a number. But here's the thing, going back to the halving on the supply side. So when we have the having, the supply gets cut in half. That's 50%. Okay, that's f- uh, 5,000 basis points. Is that right? Yeah. So 5,000 basis points compared to 25 basis points. Now, when you, look at, when you look at that, you can see, obviously, how much more of an impact this, the having is going to have versus the change in demand. So the delta of demand is so insignificant that I think it can essentially be rounded down to nothing, right? You can essentially just ignore the delta of the demand because compared to the change of supply, it's very insignificant, right? The supply is changing by 50%. Again, let me just reemphasize that because it's a staggering difference where the denominator of the demand is only changing by 25 basis points, you know, give or take. Obviously, you know, Bitcoin demand tends to grow over time. In my opinion, fiat demand tends to shrink over time. And I'll get onto the fiat side in a minute. But so let's look at the, let's finish up the the Bitcoin side of this ratio. So you've got the supply, which is fixed, and the demand, which I have um, explained why I feel like it is essential. it's essentially irrelevant. So in other words, you can consider that, you know, fixed as well. So the supply is really what matters on the Bitcoin side, and then demand is irrelevant. That's what I'm saying. And that's what, that's the point I'm trying to make. Now let's move over to the fiat side. As I mentioned, a lot of people will say that the um, supply of fiat is unknown, which is true. Um, but one thing that we can accurately predict, in my opinion, uh, is the issuance of new dollars, right? And in, in the base money. So we can actually probably pretty accurately predict how much we're going to print, like quantitative easing. So I estimate that we're probably going to print, uh, you know, about $10 trillion over the next four years. And I just got to that by the fact of the current, you know, the current trajectory that we're, we're on. I think we're printing a uh, trillion dollars every 100 days right now, I think, if that's right. So if we're printing a trillion dollars every 100 days, uh, or a trillion dollars every 100 days, you know, over four years, that's you know about ten trillion dollars. Let's keep the math easy. So we can pretty accurately predict the supply, or at least the new supply, newly issued supply of fiat, of USD. And then again, going back to the demand of that part of the ratio, you have uh, you know pretty steady demand as well. So yeah, we may see you know parts of the world falling off of the dollar, um, but the demand is pretty steady. Again let's just say 25 basis points or, you know, or flat, right? So again, I, I round that down to being in, insignificant as well. So on the supply, the numerator, I see that as a coefficient now because I think I can accurately, you know, in my mind with a reasonable degree of certainty, tell you how much we're going to print over the next four years. It's $10 trillion. The denominator is statistically irrelevant because it doesn't change very much at all. Right. No matter no matter what happens, it's very unlikely that that's going to be, you know, an order of magnitude different than 25 basis points or let's just say flat. Right. So we have a coefficient on this side where you've got the supply of Bitcoin. The denominator, I just argued, I see as a coefficient as well. 
on the other side of the equation, the supply of fiat coefficient and the denominator, the demand of fiat, I see as a coefficient as well. Again, st statistically irrelevant. So it's literally just uh, an equation of coefficients, which basically just means these models are right, but really primarily on accident, right? The stock to flow is, you know, uh, you know, looks at obviously the stock of the asset to the flow of the asset. I think it's right, but only because it just so happens to be because the chart just happens to track things in terms of accounting for that having. Now, if you look at the power law, I think that's right too. <laughs> and again, I think it's more right on accident than anything, but the power law is just looking at the historical price of Bitcoin and then projecting forward off, off of a logarithmic chart. I think, you know, if you had to compare the two, the power law makes the most sense to me because uh, it's, it's accounting for, you know, the historical price change uh, in terms of dollars a, a little bit more uh, closely. And it's using the historical data to project uh, out forward. Now, I will say, if you're looking at the last, let's just say four years, there's going to be a pretty big difference if you're just including the data since like the COVID era, because our money printing has changed so drastically. Um, but here's the point I want to try to make about these pricing models and why I think there's you know some merit to them. The actual dollar number may not necessarily be super easy to predict, but the shape of these charts, whether you're looking at it on a linear scale or a logarithmic scale, I think the shape is going to be accurate no matter what. So there is some value to these charts, I think, but not super, super valuable other than the fact that I think that there's going to be, you know, a fairly narrow band of where we're going to see the price. And I don't think it's really going to deviate too far out of that. That's interesting. I mean, the I think the the power law is, is an interesting one because then you can also even, uh, they have this bands and they even can say like, oh, we are like two months out of the Bitcoin price. We are three months out, uh, like before or after we should have, so like uh, even if if the price is going under it, you can buy more. I don't I don't believe in that. Like I, I just like uh, I just buy as much as I can, uh, because as you said before, like uh, if if you try to trade Bitcoin, if you try to time the market, you usually you normally <laughs> uh, get wrecked by it. Uh, you might have luck, but you can also go to the casino or play the lottery if you might have luck. Uh, that's why we don't have, uh, th that's not why Bitcoin is here. There's also something else. There's the other um, pricing model that Michael Saylor usually uses and also is the fundamental thing uh, that he usually bases his things on. Um, uh, the one from Jesse Myers, it's not really a, a, a price model per se, uh, because he's just looking at the, what's the total net, net asset, uh, right now. And he puts it last year at 900 trillion. So we might be well above that, uh, um, uh, at this point, but, uh, let's just say it's, it's 900 trillion. Then the interesting question for me is always like, how much of the total assets can Bitcoin actually, um, subsume like uh, when we think like okay bitcoin is money it's an, an amazing store of value it might be an amazing it, it is an amazing medium of exchange uh, maybe it's even uh, more than that when we have um, uh, things built on layer tools that also integrate with, with satoshis and, and bitcoin maybe we have then even more use cases um jesse myers uh, better known i think as, as crossus uh, on, on twitter um, he uses a very conservative, uh, estimate of 20%, which would lead us to like a 10 million, uh, uh, dollar price target in today dollars term. So like if, if there's inflation coming to that e equation, it gets way higher than that. Then there are, there's this camp where they're saying like, okay, Bitcoin is money. Money is 50% of every transaction. Uh, so it should be 50%, like Bitcoin should capture 50% of everything. Then there are, <laughs> shout out to Ratoshi. He's a, he was a fellow a guest of mine on the podcast. He thinks that um, Bitcoin will capture 99% of all energy, physical 
and financially. Uh, we made a we made a podcast around that that was really interesting, but it goes very far out in the future where we have mining around the sun and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so like there's like camps from like 20% to 99%. Uh, and I actually like, I, I'm not settled. Like I, I, that's why I asked, I think Gary Cardona asked in a podcast uh, just a few days ago what he thinks, and I will continue to ask people. Uh, and I will also ask you now, uh, what do you think if Bitcoin is successful uh, as a store of value, as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account, no matter when this is, like this could be out like 50 years, could be out 500 years, um, because the timing is always hard to predict, I feel like. Uh, but if Bitcoin is successful, how much of the total net assets uh, could Bitcoin realistically consume? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I've never been asked that question so directly before. I think personally, Bitcoin, as far as financial assets, eventually it will just be the money. I think that Bitcoin will be uh, the value component both, or I guess I should say, from a store of value, medium of exchange, and unit of account perspective of everything eventually. Now, I don't know if that happens in our lifetimes. Um, it's going to take, you know, some time. I think the answer is yes. I do believe, uh, you know, you and I are fairly young. I think that in our lifetimes, we will see Bitcoin swallow all value. And it's gonna, it kind of goes back to the Knut Svanholm uh, idea of everything divided by 21 million. Um, and I think that I, I subscribe to that. Um, so I think Bitcoin swallows everything eventually. Um, in the next 10 years, I don't know. In the next 40, I do I do think so. And, and the reason for that is um, adoption happens exponentially. Time is linear, right? So 40 years is is, is just a linear scale of time going out. So the, the closer we get to whatever moment that is of hyper Bitcoinization, the, the, the faster and more rapidly that approaches. Um, and so again, that's why I think that uh, I think that it's going to happen in less than 40 years. We're going to have this, you know, hyper Bitcoinization moment in less than 40 years because um, of all of these exponential factors, um, inflation, you know, quantitative easing, you know, the debt, being able to keep with, up with our debt, we're going to have to print, money well we're gonna have to be able to print fake money usd uh exponentially more and more every year we're gonna have to print more than we did the year before just to keep just to service our debt which is crazy um and so that's an exponential factor you know the, the fiat is going to exponentially collapse bitcoin adoption you know the amount of people that are using bitcoin today compared to the amount of people that were using it yesterday it's exponential the amount of people that are using the lightning network is exponential. The amount of people innovating and building on Bitcoin is exponential. The amount of people running nodes is exponential. The hash rate of the amount of power being used to mine Bitcoin all over the world, it's exponential. And so you have all these exponential factors compounding on a linear time scale. So that's why I think that people saying, oh, this isn't going to happen for another 100 years, I think is absolutely crazy. Because Bitcoin doesn't grow linearly. Fiat doesn't die linearly. Like it happens very suddenly. And it, it's kind of like Parker Lewis sa says, and gradually then suddenly there's, there's a moment in which everything just goes. And I think his, his mindset there is once, uh, I think, I don't want to, I don't want to mess up his, 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 um, uh, perspective on that. So I'm just going to leave it at that because I'm not an expert. Um, but I would definitely suggest, sorry, no worries. <laughs> um, where was I? It, oh, yeah. it happened to me also. Like, I think, uh, already two times uh, I had a time where I always set alarms for like certain times for like lunch break and stuff like that for myself, because I'm self-employed now. Uh, I stopped that completely and uh, I, I forgot to turn off an alarm. So like in the middle of an episode, like really loud, like, da, 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 da. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that, that happens. Um, yeah. It's, uh, if, I think pricing models in general, uh, where, where we, we were in, in, in the discussion right now, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to look at uh, where, where we are going. Uh, and you, you kind of wasn't in, in the, in the, in the long answer, 
to to discuss okay how much of the total net assets could bitcoin potentially uh, consume i mean it, it cannot be that's that's the only thing um when we think of like bitcoin is infinity um I, I love the meme from knut i love i love that kind of thinking um but realistically for me it's like a house will still have some value like it will not be free so th there will still be value in in a company there will still be a value in a real estate so it will not be completely a uh, hundred percent uh, but it could be 99 percent. so like house prices and uh, even other prices could uh, could crash down a lot like from 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 where they are here right now and those crazy high valuations maybe on even growth stocks and stuff like that highly speculative growth stock that might change in the future it's also an interesting discussion like what what bitcoin will do to the whole uh, financial world uh, building businesses venture capital and stuff like that um which i find extremely interesting to, to talk about uh but uh in 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 that uh we were currently uh, uh if, if you have your thought again yeah um and I, I my point was that i think that everything on earth will be valued against bitcoin um there will be in my opinion uh much less need for other financial instruments um you'll still have them but bitcoin will be the you know the denominating the denominating asset for every for which every other asset is compared. So um, everything else is going to be an opportunity cost to not holding the Bitcoin. And so it will definancialize every other asset. Uh, people will not, you know, buy a house because it's going to go up in value because people are going to know that it's going to fall in value. Um, and you, I mean, you see this, we have, we have precedent all over the planet. You, the United States and, and a lot of advanced um, you know, what we would call first world countries, you know, this is, it's kind of an anomaly. Most countries don't have appreciating real estate prices. And so they don't put a ton of, a, a ton of money into the real estate. You know, you buy a house, it gets older, it starts to fall apart, it loses value. But <laughs> in some countries, we've got it all backwards because our, our, you know, our, our, our fiat is so broken that we have to find other places to put our, our money. And so we buy real estate to try to preserve our value, but we buy, you know, stocks and equities, we buy bonds. Um, we do all these things to financialize all these other assets and all that's eventually going to go away. That's my point. It's all going to go to Bitcoin. Um, the financial aspect of everything will diminish in perpetuity compared to Bitcoin. I want to if we can change gears real quick, I, there's, there's, there's kind of a subject I wanted to touch on um, just hopping back to using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. There's one point that I, that I want to make, and I, I, I failed to mention it earlier. And that is that capital gains, in the United States uh, is, is pretty unique because if you've got long-term capital gains that you're using and you don't have any other form of income, you can actually pay zero to the IRS um, so long as you stay below a certain threshold. So, for example, if you're married filing jointly, if you make less than ninety four thousand and fifty dollars in all, you know, for all of your income, you're you have, you know, let's just say you don't have a job. Let's say you're Bitcoin rich and you just want to retire and live off of your long term capital gains. You can you can sell ninety four thousand. Well, let me let me rephrase that. You can have. $94,050 of capital gains that you don't have to pay taxes on as long as you're married filing jointly. So if you're married, if you're single, it's like half of that. Um, but if you're married filing jointly, you can sell as much Bitcoin as you need to up to $94,050 of gains. So, you know, if your cost basis is zero, you would of course, be selling $94,050, but most people's cost basis is not zero, which means you can actually sell a lot more than that. Like you could easily sell over six figures of Bitcoin every year, live on that and pay zero dollars in tax to the IRS, which is really cool. I mean, that's not special to Bitcoin. That's just how long-term capital gains taxes work. Um, and so that's like a really cool strategy. That's what I plan on doing. I'm going to retire. I'm going to you know, stop working and having uh, an, an income, so to speak. Um, I'm going to not sell assets. 
you know, or I will sell assets, but it's going to be long-term capital gains assets. So I'm going to live off of my assets, which is, you know, primarily Bitcoin. So I'll sell my Bitcoin for dollars to pay for what I need to. And again, you know, I'm of the mindset where I like to encourage people to use Bitcoin to better their lives. I'm not advocating for people to spend over their means. That's not at all what I'm saying. Okay. I don't want to be confused here and say, oh, you know, Adam said I should go spend all my Bitcoin. Like, no, that's not at all. That's not at all my point. My point is, you know, live frugally, live, live within your means and use Bitcoin as a tool to better those means. So don't spend any more than you already are, already need to, but use Bitcoin in such a way to where you're, 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 you're financing your, your life, the things that you need, and you're spending your Bitcoin on the things that are more valuable to you than holding that Bitcoin in the moment. So uh, Jack Mahler recently talked about this, um, and he brings up the point that Bitcoin, spending Bitcoin, you know, is an opportunity cost. And you have to compare every, every purchase that you make to the opportunity cost that you're losing in holding Bitcoin, the, that same Bitcoin. So in, in any given moment, like, you know, we need to eat. We need shelter. We need transportation. You know, these are things that I think is, is healthy to spend your Bitcoin on, especially if you don't have any fiat, right? I'm not saying hold a bunch of fiat and then just use your Bitcoin. That's not, also not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you want to move everything over to Bitcoin, it's okay to spend your Bitcoin on the things that you need to live. Because as you hold your Bitcoin, as the price appreciates, your purchasing power goes up and you're better off. And I, I demonstrated that earlier. Going back to the opportunity cost, you know, there's that's one of the main points of why people don't spend their Bitcoin. Their people are against Bitcoin because they believe that the opportunity cost is greater. My my argument is that the opportunity cost of not spending Bitcoin is actually greater because you're you have to hold fiat in order to do that. I wrote an article about a year and a half ago. It's called Bitcoin is spending. I wrote it on uh, the Belt of Truth Substack, which is uh, produced by Ulrich Patillo. And um, I, I cover really like the four major reasons why people are hesitant to spend Bitcoin. Just give you a real quick overview. I have Gresham's Law. I have cost, which includes opportunity cost and also the, the, the real nominal cost as well. Code of conduct and taxes. And what I found is that a very large number of people are not spending Bitcoin for some reason that they actually don't agree with. And in the article, if, if you're interested, you can read it. But um, in the article, I go through and kind of explain why none of these actually make sense if you actually walk them all the way through. And so my, it, it's, a, it's an argumentative article. I try to persuade, um, persuade the, the reader to, uh, to look at things in a different light. At the time I wrote the article, I actually uh, focused on uh, spending Bitcoin in a way that eliminated capital gains taxes entirely. So I advocated for what's called the currency swap method. Um, a lot of people are, uh, are familiar with uh, Strike and how Strike works. And so I outlined how you can spend fiat over the Bitcoin rails and, and avoid capital gains taxes. Um, but I've, I've, sim I've, I've since changed my mind. Now I believe that it's okay to put everything into Bitcoin, um, move all of my fiat savings into Bitcoin and move all my fiat spending into Bitcoin. Um, and that has, has uh, turned out to be a good, a good choice for myself. I, I love that a lot because then you get the, the full power of, of Bitcoin and you really, you really use it, uh, as, as, as what you should have used it, uh, as, as money. I, I love that a lot. Really cool. Um, also for retirement, uh, the one point that like the, the question that always comes up in, in people's mind, um, the average age of, of my viewer is around 45 years old. So let's just use that age. Uh, people kind of want to retire, uh, maybe at like 60, 65, maybe the concept of retirement for me is also like, uh, you should retire as, as early as possible. If you consider retirement only doing what you love, but let's take the, the traditional approach where you are retiring, uh, from a normal job. Um, 
is there a framework where you think of like, okay, that's that's at least that that many Bitcoin you should have to to retire? Because that's the question that always comes up a lot, and I I see this uh, as as I have a lot of data with like how many people are asking that question and and how many people uh, wanting to get across that topic. Do you have something uh, um, to think about that? Yeah, let me just start by saying I don't know, and I don't think anybody can tell you that they do know for a fact, but I can guess. Um, my framework is such, I think if you take whatever your expenses are for a year, all right, um, let's just say it, it costs you $50,000 to live. Okay. What I recommend doing is taking half or sorry, let me, let me back up. I recommend doubling your cost of living. So you, so let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you spend $50,000 a year to live Take the other 50 and put it into Bitcoin. This is not specific financial advice. This is just my method in which, you know, I think is, is applicable to myself and, you know, could pan out to work out for other people too. I don't know. But my point is live below your means and take just take the exact amount that it costs for you to live and put that into Bitcoin. If you don't have the ability, maybe you don't make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Most people don't lower your cost of living, right? It's Give up the Netflix Netflix subscription. You know, don't stop going out to eat. Just stop spending a bunch of extra money that you don't need. Suffer for the time being a little bit more in order to preserve the value for your future, right? So in order to save, you've got to postpone that instant gratification. You can have the gratification later. It's gonna it's gonna exponentially compound uh, for you. Um, that's my belief. So here's what I say: take the amount that it costs for you to live double that. Okay. That's the amount that you need to, that, that, that's your income. Half of that goes to Bitcoin. Half of that goes to your expenses. Do that for eight years. I think at the end of that eight years, you can do whatever you want with your life. I love that model. Dub, uh, with double also. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. At a minimum. Again, I, I use the, the example of, of, of your living expenses because, um, you know, you're, you should be able to sustain at least that lifestyle or better for the next you know, until you, until you, until you die, probably and forever. It, cause, it, cause Bitcoin's never going to stop appreciating against real assets in the world. Yeah. That, that, that's the, another thing. If you take Bitcoin as retirement, you are benefiting from everything else getting cheaper in Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. that's a, uh, it's a, it's a major thing. Really cool. And um, we're already at uh, well over one hour, uh, which means that this brings me to my end routine of the of the podcast. The the first question is for you uh, that every guest of mine gets. What can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Well, I have a passion for trying to convince people to use Bitcoin how I think they should do it. <laughs> I say that a little bit tongue tongue in cheek because Bitcoin's obviously. Uh, whatever you make of it. Um, and, and for some people, it's, it's going to be different than others. But um, my, my point is recently, I've, I've been trying to uh, show people that it's okay to spend Bitcoin and actually can, can benefit, benefit you in the long run um, to, to use Bitcoin as, as a medium of exchange, as well as a unit of account. So um, that's kind of the mission that I'm on right now. Um, I realize that the tools that exist aren't perfect. I've come into my own set of struggles with, with using Bitcoin as a, as a payment mechanism, uh, trouble with the lightning network, um, trouble with taxes, um, just, you know, having a, a good set of tools to use. So I've decided to build my own. And so recently I've set off, sat, set out on this, um, mission to build uh, a product that, that is going to help with some of those shortcomings of what currently exists. So, as I understand it right now, it's really hard to find something that is self-custodial, meaning you hold your own keys and doesn't come with a bunch of extra headaches like opening and managing lightning channels. So um, I'm building Mana Wallet for that purpose. Um, so Mana is just a, a wallet that is going to be fully self-custodial, self meaning you hold your own keys, but also has a lot of automation, uh, both on uh, like the channel management side. So our average user is not going to even need to know what a channel is. They just need to know, you know, I need this this amount of sats or even denominated in dollars. I need $5 worth of Bitcoin um, and they can receive that or send it as needed. 
Um, and then it'll also have some automation on the tax side as well. So it'll make taxes easier. So essentially what we're trying to do is, is eliminate all of the reasons why people don't want to spend Bitcoin and don't give them a good reason for not wanting to spend Bitcoin. I, I love that mission. <laughs> really cool. Um, the last, uh, the, the, end, the last end routine of our, of our podcast is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest uh, actually is. And your question from the previous guest, I now remember it was actually uh, directly Gary Cardone. He always asked that question. Uh, what does freedom mean to you? What does freedom mean to me? Freedom to me is being able to say and do what you want without being subjected to somebody else. Yeah. I think that's, that's, it's kind of actually goes to what he says, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little bit different, but I think that's like the, the, uh, the, the, the definition I also subscribe to. Yeah. Really cool. Thank you so much, um, Adam, for, for being on the show. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions and, 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 and yeah, subscribe to your channels. I'm on X at Adam Semeca. And if you want to follow uh, the wallet that we're building, it's at Mana Bitcoin, M-A-N-N-A -N -N -A, Bitcoin. Perfect. Thank you so much, Adam, for, for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone watching and listening, uh, for being on my show today. Uh, as always, uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.